So this is, uh, at least you should think that uh, we were engaging in deceptive practices. Um, this session is billed as a luncheon session, so um, it is not, you know, manipulated in any way. It uh, is uh, to, uh, in one day, pack in a lot of uh, sessions and uh, both the policy and organizational challenges facing think tanks. And so uh, we're very lucky to have um, two speakers um, who uh, bring a wealth of experience and uh, experience from uh, different uh, organizational types uh, that I think will uh, help us understand the, the challenges uh, facing uh, think tanks in India and uh, the um, uh, how they're meeting those uh, challenges, both in terms of programs and strategies. Um, I want to preface the, the, the discussion because we have talked about, lamented, uh, and I think in terms of previous sessions, all of the challenges and ills facing and limitations facing uh, think tanks in India um, and about the problems. Um, but I think it's essential that we begin to think about um, transferring the best practices, the, the approach that institutions have taken in terms of innovation and adaptation. Um, and there are plenty, both domestically and internationally, um, that I think reflect that and we will hear from our colleagues in, in, in a few moments. Um, I thought it would be helpful just to quickly uh, give a, um, a quick survey of what th some think tanks are doing around the world. Um, one, in terms of uh, in, in Latin America, so it's, I tend not to uh, uh, focus on US think tanks, um, but look at a sort of the global experience. Um, and so if you look at an institution like the Vatilio Vargas Foundation in Brazil, and in terms of the things we're talking about, um, is, was able to, in not the most recent election, but the uh, election, uh, prior election, um, in every state and municipality in Brazil, was able in real time, using big data, to know what were the interest and preferences of the electorate in that election. Um, and, and so that, I mean, and, and these questions, which I think are in other contexts in terms of if you look at Uber or if you look at Airbnb, those disruptors are instructive um, for think tanks. One, because they're doing it cheaper, faster, and more convenient for consumers. That is not, it should not be something that is lost on us because there are new and compelling um, examples. Additionally, and focus for those of you who were at the Brussels summit, the global think tank summit, um, we had a presentation from Ethos Policy Lab in Mexico, which created a comic on corruption and how um, civil society organizations and ethos, which is a think tank, is combating um, corruption. It was a collaboration between the leading comic book uh, in um, Mexico and ethos, which is a, a leading think tank there. They printed 450,000 copies. Uh, and the nature of comics is that they're passed around. And so someone at the meeting did a quick calculation. So 2.5 million people uh, were touched by that single uh, thing. And th the issue is thinking about new and different ways to present materials. Uh, in the US context, uh, CSIS has created a uh, ideas lab which introduces innovation. Uh, and in terms of what was referenced today in terms of the South China Sea, has used uh, global um, imaging uh, to essentially ad identify and document over time, in time lapse, uh, China's um, developing uh, islands uh, uh, and building bases 
uh, which are incredibly uh, provocative, uh, but documenting that uh, was significant. Um, it had was featured uh, in the U.S. on um, 60 Minutes and front page in the New York Times. And so the point of all this is harnessing technology to essentially uh, enhance research, which is something that we need to look at. Um, we will be hosting a, a group of think tanks from around the world on AI, which will look at the impact, policy impact of AI, the impact on governance and the impact on think tanks. And the final part, obviously, is you know how do uh, think tanks harness AI to enhance uh, their uh, research? And clearly, and I'll cl close with two examples from other industries. In terms of uh, uh, law, um, AI is now making it possible for a lawyer who is arguing a case to essentially survey every single case that is similar to the one he or she is arguing and identify the best and most persuasive argument uh, in that case. Secondly, um, it is now possible for doctors to survey all of the clinical trials related to a specific cancer and to identify uh, the, the most effective, efficacious clinical interventions. Um, that is power. That is something that is not lost on policymakers and others that we need to identify because the question is, if it's FGV in terms of being able to understand what in every municipality, state and municipality in uh, Brazil, what is on the priority and interest of the electorate, why do you need a think tank? If you are able to essentially do massive analysis uh, using AI, why do you need a think tank? These are questions I think there are clear answers to because the intervention of both lawyers still need to argue a case, doctors still need uh, to uh, treat patients, uh, and think tanks must continue to think and analyze, and that's the function, but those who essentially harness um, technology to enhance what they're doing uh, will survive. Those that do not, uh, I think, face very dis difficult challenges ahead. One final example, which is you know, connected to uh, the panels is, and the increasing thing in terms of where we are, is collaboration. Uh, and collaboration in new and different ways in terms of, uh, and the employment in terms of the, re, the new business model for think tanks is hiring data scientists, which have not traditionally been a part of the staff of think tanks. The other is an interesting, Thing, if you and uh, uh, Jamal is formerly of Al Jazeera, um, that Al Jazeera is has a think tank which is connected to the media outlet of uh, of Al Jazeera. They produced uh, on Syria uh, a piece that was a collaboration in terms of research and the news network that had uh, 1.2 billion views. When I said this in a meeting, everyone recoiled, how is that possible? Uh, and so I went back to them and said, is that correct? Because, you know, people were so incredulous that I think, and it was correct. And so the, the point is, how do you, in terms of reaching and influencing in a quality way, how do you do that? And against tweets and the reductionist thing, we have a real challenge. And I would suggest that s this morning's discussion of looking at the long term, the challenge think tanks now have is you have to look at the immediate and midterm and long term simultaneously. That if you can't explain what's happening in the streets of Brazil or France to key people uh, and you're clueless on that, you increasingly are of no use uh, to policymakers. So without further ado, and the focus on you know, how key institutions in India are meeting these challenges, um, 
I would first turn to Dr. Uh, Raul Tangia, Senior Fellow of Governance Studies Program at the Brookings Institution in India. Thank you, James, and uh, apologies, I missed the morning session. My health hasn't been perfect. If I start coughing, I have an excuse. <clears throat> I want to just preface what I say with the usual disclaimer. Oh, yes. That these are... Yeah, let me do that. Uh, these, uh, as have been all the previous meetings, are uh, Chatham House rule, so... Um, it's without attribution for the individual or the institution they represent with the objective of having a free and open discussion. Thank you. Um, and I'm actually, there's a small error. I, I'm a fellow with the uh, Cross Brookings Initiative on Energy, Climate, and Sustainability, so even though governance overlaps. So that's another general problem, which is silos and how do people engage. So I'll, I'll actually come to that issue. Uh, and it gets even harder when you talk of something like energy or telecom or even health, where there's health, but there's economics, there's public policy, and now behavioral. If you talk of a lot of the changes in both economics and public policy, the behavioral consumer aspect is not getting enough attention uh, for multiple reasons. So the disclaimer is not... Chatham House per se, but the disclaimer is actually from our institution's point of view, there is no institutional view. All the views in all our publications are by the scholars. The institute has no say in what they say, and hopefully two of them may disagree at the same point if they have valid observations, and that's a rare sort of thing amongst think tanks in, in India. The, my background is as not just being with Brookings from India from the start, but I was involved with the setup of another large think tank in India now 10, 15, 12 years ago, and was an academic since 98 uh, at Carnegie Mellon. So <clears throat> when we set up this other think tank, in fact, the same question that you've probably even del del deliberated a little is, in the Indian context, what does a think tank even mean? How do people view it? Is it a NGO? Is it civil society? Is it at doing advocacy? Or is it doing research? And there is a whole spectrum, and there can be overlap, but the government especially hasn't really figured it out because they view everyone giving inputs as consultants. And then that word itself should tell you a little of how transactive they view inputs and also how much control they want to have. So this focus that many of you and we try and do on independence is really tough, not just because of the money side of it, the funding, but also on the data side and also in the engagement side. Because if you're helping the government achieve its targets, they love you. What do you need? We'll give it to you. But if you say, just give us the same data, what do you want it for? No, no, we just want to study. No. It's, it's very tough to get a lot of these. So think tanks end up cons competing in some ways with consultants. A lot of my work is on sustainability, and I look at large research programs that the government does, and it essentially looks for inputs to what they already have in their mind, or people to run the programs. So you have, for example, foreign governments through their donor agencies, USAID, DFID, GIZ, a bunch of countries actually doing work that in some ways could have also been done by think tanks or groups within India, and part of me sort of says, it's not about the money, because just getting X million dollars or pounds from so-and-so isn't India's bottleneck. So what's really going on? So all of these tie into, I mean, two of the obvious things that people know about is A, funding. How do think tanks get funding that lets them remain independent? How do you get good data? And these translate into all sorts of huge amounts of disproportional effort sent, spent on compliance. So if there's one thing the government could or should do is improve its transparency on are you or aren't you compliant and what do you do about it. Whether it's FCRA, we have collaborating, partnering institutions we know who have been in limbo due to FCRA. We have, including renewals, 
income tax itself, what is tax deductible, what is not, how come you're traveling, how come you stay at a five-star hotel? <gasps> My God, are we in a five-star hotel right now? Sorry. Uh, <clears throat> Don't think so. Okay. Not sure. Okay. TBD, <clears throat> yes. And all sorts of these distractions just suck up mind space of, of, of think tanks. So coming to the government, the f hardest challenge we have is how do you work with the government instead of for the government? And the government has, has in India has historically had high powered, uh, high and imp high level empowered committees. So these are committees set up with statutory weight and then they have smart or powerful and or powerful people on them and six months later it's over. So you don't get the institutional memory that you really want for these sorts of things. Can inst think tanks play certain roles of doing such analyses? Because a lot of things can't happen in three months. I've seen committee reports submitted in four weeks. Why? Because that was the terms of reference. So how do you do long form research is another very big problem. Because a lot of the challenges we're dealing with, I heard a little on the healthcare side in the earlier, or in sustainability, these are not only long-term complex problems, these are things to which nobody on earth really knows the answer because they're moving targets. If you just wait for traditional approaches, it may take too long. Then you've got new constraints like climate or uh, inequality and so many other factors. I don't think anyone really knows the best models. And so how do you deal in that space when the government's really saying, tell me the answer? So if you have an answer, they, they, not just the government, but even media, public mind space seems to like it. Well, if you go back to Nixon's, on the other hand, he wants a one-armed policy advisor because he's sick and tired of on the other hand. Well, there is the other hand, and that's part of what think tanks can grapple with, or at least ideally should have the luxury of being able to grapple with. Now, obviously, you're not academic university style. There's a little more focus. There's a little more policy prescriptiveness that can come out of it. But that starting point really needs to be there. You mentioned tech. I mean, I can't tell you how many energy meetings I've been to where the two words I hear the most are AI, blockchain, blockchain, AI. So uh, luckily, we didn't hear about blockchain yet for, for, for this space. But certainly, these are all useful tools. But the fundamentals of the research don't change. The tools can change. But the engagement, I think, is where a lot of think tanks struggle. We would love to do great research, but then what? So how do you translate it? How do you convert levels? How do you even get local language discussions? We've not done as well as what we know we should do. Because otherwise, we end up with Delhi speak. You're, you're sitting in English medium, maximum Hindi translations. Well, we've only had a handful of publications done in regional languages, but it needs to be more. Data, we've already, I've already mentioned it. There's a lot of mindset issue. Another big challenge, and I'll come to funding and independence with an anecdote, near, I'm nearing the end. Do I have a few more, two minutes more? Sure. Yes. Okay. Um, I think another big challenge civil society and think tanks need to speak out against is how the government views public and private very differently, educational and non-educational. So if you're a government university, they can write you a check for a crore or two crore. Now, if you're doing this exact same work, maybe differently, maybe even better in some ways, but you're an independent think tank, sorry, I can't fund you. Or they have to put out a bid. I don't know how many of you have ever been involved with government bidding and this rush towards what they call L1, L1 means lowest cost, and that equals transparency as per some auditors. And it's not because you really don't want to be doing the cheapest research. You want to be doing the best research at the most affordable manner. And changing that mindset is not easy because, and this has been told by a secretary of the government of India at a workshop we were running, all decisions we end up making seem to be driven by the four Cs. Courts, CBI, CVC, and CAG. They're worried about audits and oversight. And so it's a lot easier to just do conventional thinking, conventional engagement, conventional funding. Don't rock the boat because you minimize your downsides, but the flip is you've minimized your upside as well. And that's a very big deal for when we're 
in the investigative and analytic sort of space. <clears throat> research itself is changing, and that's another problem. We talked of technology not just on the dissemination side, but even collaboration and peer review is very different. Journals themselves are under flack, rightfully so, I think, on how closed many of the quote-unquote best ones are. So if you're a hardcore economist, your mantra in life seems to be five journals or six. And so that's another problem. So if you're focusing on quality peer review versus quality dissemination versus quality engagement, some, the same people aren't necessarily able to do all of them. How do we balance that? And the last sort of surprising thing, you know, uh, in a land of 1.3 billion, we're still struggling to find good people. And we want the best to join. And if you look at industry, where do the top university students go? Industry, but not just industry, two specific subsets of industry, tech or finance, and consulting overlapping. And how do you get the best and brightest to want to do research, not academia? So even out of the people interested in research, a lot of who we try and recruit end up saying, I'd rather just go to a university. And so it's a very hard space to explain, hard space to excite people, and so the default ends up being you get very good people finding a second life or second career here in think tanks as well. But that's not the only thing that sh think tanks should be recruiting towards. C putting it together going forward, so I think the good news is whether it's due to limits on all of the challenges of before, we're changing the rules. I think we're being a lot more innovative in how we engage, how we disseminate. Think tanks now have people from industry, half-time, part-time, floating, consultative arrangements. These aren't just positions for lifers. So it's not that you start here and work your way up this mythical ladder. So I think that's a good change that this space is seeing. So we want all forms of engagement, even if you come to the border of advocacy. I don't think that's a bad thing, as long as you're transparent that this is disparate, dispassionate sort of <coughs> research, descriptive, here's prescriptive, and then here's even more hand-holding, here's engagement, implementation. There's all these layers of public change, theories of change. It's okay to participate in all of them, or can we collaborate? So the other thing we've sort of learned is critical mass is probably one of the key needs. A lot of think tanks focus on sort of experts or genius, like in software they talk about genius coders. They can design and then the rest is all labor. Think tanks don't quite work that way. So it's great to have outstanding either practitioners, ex-government folks or scholars, professors, but they need a critical mass and that's how you really grow. And so whether that's within the institute, collaborative, I mean, Brookings, India, compared to Brookings in DC is small, it's independent, so we have our own funding, our own people, projects. <coughs> we can't do it all, so we collaborate with including some of the folks around the room. Can we also try, do more synthesis work? This comes back to what's the role of think tanks. If you're only giving answers, you're gonna do some sets of work, but if you're not worried about the four Cs, then you can actually come back and do constructive criticism. Of course, that's an art more than a science, but yeah. And lastly, as we seek funding, one of the challenges we have in wish lists is really, can people supporting us recognize the need for flexible funding, which isn't project-oriented, deliverable-oriented, but things that let you step back and also go with the flow of what the needs of the government are. So when COP comes around in the energy world, three to six months are spent entirely on that. When you have a global treaty coming up for something or when there's an election or some other major issue, then that's gonna take the oxygen out of research. Are we just observers or commentators or are we actually participants into that? It depends a little bit on how much freedom your institute allows you. Thank you. Wonderful and uh, rich presentation. And uh, the issue of independence has come up previously, and I think it's worth probing the various dimensions, including those that you've mentioned in terms of not only legal but financial, and to what extent the institution has a culture of 
of respecting that. I think that, once again, is a comparative advantage in India if you compare it to, say, China, where there's v almost no adherence to uh, and, in fact, an understanding of the scientific principle and the elements of that of replication, critical thinking, et cetera, um, India is, is uh, well, uh, well uh, established and respect uh, for those principles. <clears throat> I think it's interesting in terms of hired minds, and we had a, you know, a summit which both consultant, consulting firms and um, uh, think tanks that are in what I describe as the consulting uh, model, so um, uh, RAND, uh, in terms of the title of the of the of the uh, innovation summit, and was think tanks as consulting firms and consulting firms as think tanks. I mean, and the basic objective I had in mind is, what did, why are consulting firms getting the business that think tanks should have? And and in many respects, uh, you know the competitors for think tanks now are law firms, consulting firms, advocacy groups, and lobbying, which raises a whole question which you didn't address or were on the edges of, that there's a lot more bleeding in terms of what is a think tank, meaning that organizationally the lines aren't as firm as they used to be, that institutional aspects, which is really a part of the world that we're now in, uh, redefines what organizations are and they have, may have quite different dimensions um, in that. The other thing that I would quickly mention in terms of a presentation in Brussels on AI is that we are two years out from uh, being able to translate pretty much any language and major documents. This is from someone who is the leading expert on that. So the barriers within India and across countries in terms of one disseminating what is produced in, were, were there. Um, the recruiting issue, I think, is an interesting one. I and mean, the question in terms of India is with so many, in terms of my students, you know, part of the problem which was identified by, by panels in Latin America and in Brussels is that most people don't know what think, most kids in college don't know what a think tank is. And one of the things that they said that, could, that think tanks could do better is explain what a think tank is and that if they knew, they would be uh, interested in, in working uh, at them. All right, I'd also like to get a further explanation or in the Q&A. What do you mean by critical mass? You know, what is, what is the right mix between fixed and variable core and how does that relate to critical mass? But uh, without further ado, I mean, an interesting model from my perspective and I was able to, to visit uh, with uh, the Hindu um, center um, for uh, politics and public policy, which you know, the, there is a connection in terms of the inter uh, relationship in terms of where people come from. The director uh, had spent time at the Institute uh, for Politics, and there was a center for uh, press politics and public policy at the Kennedy School, which uh, helped provide the, in some at least some dimensions, the. The, the core of uh, the center. So I'm very interested in hearing um, this sort of blending that exists and how you manage those tensions in terms of the operation. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Rahul. Thank you, everybody. Um, from the Hindu Center for Pop Politics and Public Policy, part of the uh, Hindu group of publications. Uh, I'll start with two points. One is the, bigger, the larger concern about funding. Fortunately, we don't have to think about it because we're fully supported by the newspaper. And uh, being a newspaper, we have always been trained to be voices of criticism and, con and concern and dissent. And that's nothing's going to take those three core elements of a democracy away. So, by, and then my other question is, where do we fit in as an industry? Uh, I think that's something which think tanks, not just here, but everywhere. We, we've now come to a state where Jim would rightly say we are the fifth estate. But then uh, what do we really do? Um, are we in the business of what, what kind of, because you're talking about modeling, finances, etc. I would like to categorize ourselves as being part of the knowledge industry. We create knowledge, 
we share knowledge, we disseminate knowledge, we aggregate knowledge. So if we were to think ourselves as a knowledge industry, I think we'd be able to get other things in place, like our business units, our models, everything falls in place. So perhaps I'd suggest that that's something which we could take forward at, mm. at, uh, as we go forward, uh, not just here, but elsewhere as well. And uh, the specific areas in which Jim had mentioned with us was this, uh, this very close interaction between what a daily newspaper does and what we as a research branch do in that organization. I'm a journalist by background. My colleague Satrashi Uzi is also a journalist by background. We, we, handle, we, are, we report to a board of management who are all journalists by background. And we report to a larger board which is, which has run a newspaper co company for more than 100 years now, more than 150 years. So that, that, that takes a lot of questions away in the sense that, um, and we are given operational freedom completely. And uh, we have three areas of operation. One is research, we support research. We support research in the sense that we, we'd like to believe that we do give financial assistance for researchers uh, on a par or even more than what the UGC does. Uh, we, we support short-term research. We support 30 plus researchers till now. How they do it is they come up with a proposal, a statement of purpose, which we vet. Uh, we draw a long list, then we draw a short list, and then they're interviewed. We get about, f we call to the interview about four times the number of vacancies. So everybody gets a good shot at it. And then they, they left, left for themselves. It's their research. We have no say in influencing what the outcome is, but we do have uh, a, a benchmark to, for publication. We do have a benchmark, we peer, we sort of, because uh, we, the interview board picks up the scholars and then each scholar is mentored by a, an area specialist and they report to us on a, on a weekly or periodic basis. And uh, even the report is to and fro, till, till it comes to an acceptable standard, not in terms of uh, emphasis, not in terms of findings and output, but quality of research. Is, is methodology correct? Is everything? And uh, then we publish them. And we've got pretty good response, I must say, because uh, I must also add a caveat here, which I think perhaps others in our field would also agree, is that the work we largely do is that of post-mortem. Um, a policy is up there and then we do an analysis about it. At the push comes to shove, we do what could be called anticipatory research. Like something is being thought about. A classic example I would say is the we supported research on post office bank in India before it became operationalized. So this scholar went to post, post, post offices and so I studied the issues, studied the problems there, and then came up with the research. But again, it was already in the making. So we largely do, and I, I'd, I'd like to be corrected on that with, with examples, is that we largely do uh, post-mortem research, and at times we do anticipated research. One challenge is how are we going to change that? I think that's going to be very difficult because um, it's ideating is largely a state Monopoly. Max Weber would stop, is talk about monopolies of the state. I think ideating also becomes a state monopoly in addition to taxation and law and order and lawmaking. Ideating is largely becoming a state monopoly now. I think that is something which we need to address. How do we really send ideas up from the ground? And the other uh, area of our research, the challenges in research for us is to really find uh, not as much as to find good scholars, but to find scholars who are dependable enough to, to stick to their word and submit what they do. We do have checks and balances, but unfortunately some of them uh, find think tanks as resting places before they get a more secure tenure or a more secure job. We try our best to find good quality and determined and uh, scholars who stay the course, but that's, that's going to be one challenge. That's one challenge we faced. I, I'd like to know about other institutions as well. Are we, are we becoming more uh, transitory nests for a bird which is in a, on a long migration journey? It's something that we, we need to look at ourselves. The, and uh, a second branch of operation are programs. We have public programs which have found overwhelming support in Chennai. Uh, all, our, all our programs are packed. 
uh, to capacity, and they want more. But what we have carefully chosen not to do is to say that in anything, you know, that we don't say there will be a meeting every month. Because what we do is then we trap ourselves into a bind in which we got to deliver every month. So we take issues as they come. If more than one in a month, fine. If none for three months, even then fine. So we want to address core issues and uh, we've taken the, then them up and we- Can you provide an example of programs that you- Right, when uh, a few years ago when there was a lot of talk about sedition in India, the abuse of Article 124, we held one on sedition. And we had a multi-panel. We had a police officer, we had a lawyer, we had a journalist. Mm. And that was, to pack, that was to packed house. So that is one example. And when uh, very recently we did one on public health and health care. Because again, there is a new national health policy which is coming up. It talks about tax funded uh, health care, insurance funded health care. So we had health experts talk about that. Mm. Then we also had uh, special lectures on climate change. We had uh, the uh, former minister for um, environment talk to us. We had the editor-in-chief of the Guardian UK talk to us. We had a series of lectures on um, climate change. So we take issues that are of core importance and which people can relate to instantly. And that's, that's uh, and it's, it's again free admission, it's advertised, and we, we do follow a registration system so that we have an, a tab on the numbers who come in and thereby adjust our uh, call for invitees. Um, so that's, that's the second branch. Where the challenge there is that uh, to find high quality speakers. Because uh, as is quite well known, capital cities, it's not just Delhi, it could be Colombo, it could be DC, it could be any place, it could be London for instance. Capital cities tend to absorb a lot more uh, attention. So getting that, if, 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 we are, if there are flyby speakers, we'd like to engage them as well. So we do that. The third part of our activity is commentary and um, other publications. Uh, a newspaper, a trained as a newspaper reporter, I can write something for 35 words. And uh, push comes to shove, I can write for 75 words, 150 words, 1,500 words, full stop. That's it. I go to a magazine, I can do, say, 1,750, 2,000 words. Full stop. Uh, what we took a conscious decision was, because ours was, uh, if we were to sum it up, it is, it is uh, content with academic rigor, with journalist ease of access. Both boxes have to be ticked. We just don't want said here today and that's it and be done with it. We don't want ipso factos, ceteris paribus, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And we don't want either of that with respect, but we do respect both of that. So we want that convergence, and we've been pretty successful in terms that uh, uh, we have uh, 1.3 to 1.5 lakh uh, followers on Facebook, which has been steady at that thing. Uh, we've got about 40,000 odd repeat, mm -hmm. thing, which I, the numbers, numbers may look very, ins very small, if I, even if I compare it with the newspaper as such, but as, as, a, as a specialized, uh, uh, platform for research and serious engagement. It is, it is something which we've been there and Jim, coincidentally Jim and we started our voyage together six years and we've come to where we are. Um, what kind of content we do is that we want a minimum of 2,500 words. We'd like, uh, a newspaper, a magazine would not allow citations. We'd like citations. We have a, we have a house style which is more easy to understand kind of a citation. Uh, we do all that back end of the job. And suppose, uh, suppose somebody were to submit to us, uh, suppose somebody were to make a submission to a newspaper, you don't hear from it unless you see it published. Or just, it gets edited on its own and it gets it published. For us it's not, so we to and fro. We make an edit, we send it back. And it's to and fro till both of us come to an acceptable publishable standard and then we publish it. And uh, has it had impact? Yes, in, in some ways, uh, we've, some of our publications, especially there was one on the electronic voting machines and the VVPAT, which, is, which has been a controversy both in the, the US and in India. And one, uh, we had a retired civil service officer write on that and he was very kindly invited by the election commission to 
discuss his points further. So we, and, but after that, what happens? It, it hits a wall, you know, like because there is something that's already been decided. There's only so much uh, bodies can do in any environment, more so in increasingly different days of what uh, Jim uh, rightly pointed out about populism and uh, strong leaders around. So there, is, there are things which we have to come across, which we do. So these are some of the um, uh, work areas we do, some of the synergies. We, with regards to synergies we bring in, we, uh, being on the same uh, thing as, as a media uh, industry, uh, we share our, resource, we, uh, our resources are shared. Uh, the newspaper's resources are shared with us in terms of back-end operations, server space. Uh, yes, photographs, for instance, because uh, every story needs a photograph. And the impact of a photograph is very, very, we went in for a full re website redesign, and we tried to keep it uh, the character of um, a knowledge center. And we've been there, and we hope with a lot of more supported collaboration in terms of ideas, ideation, um, contribution in terms of content. All we, all we want is good quality content, and we'll be happy to take it forward, and I'm happy to uh, take any questions going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, uh, two, two things that I would point out and uh, would want to immediately take questions uh, is, uh, have you followed uh, an example I didn't provide, but well in advance of Donald Trump, which has been a boon for the New York Times, uh, they created an ideas lab that transformed the New York Times and how it's presented, and they now have more subscribers as a result of that than they've had in the history of the paper. So I was wondering if you, you followed that, uh, something that you know a group of think tanks might consider right. in order to do that. And then the, the issue of uh, a newspaper that has, is involved in public policy and politics, uh, and then on the other side, is there, where's the firewall in terms of the, uh, between the paper and the views of the paper versus the scholars? How do you manage those tensions, which are a part of think tanks, but it manifests themselves in different ways, and the, the interconnection is walking distance right. within your organization versus some of the others. Uh, but open it up for questions. Yes? Uh, I think, uh, you know, it's, uh, I would like to take off from, um, from where you ended, Jim, and I think this is an important point because uh, we are living in an <coughs> Oh, I'm, I'm Harsh Pant. I'm from uh, Observe Research Foundation. Uh, so the issue here is that uh, I think we live in an age where every single public institution's trust in that institution is being questioned. And we have seen this, the, you know, whether we talk of rise of populism and we see that how uh, political systems are being questioned, how democracy itself is being questioned, how institutions like uh, journalists, uh, you know, the state of journalism is being questioned. So the question for a think tank uh, today is more fundamental, that how do you reach out to the other side? Because if I'm a think tank that articulates that, look, I have, I have this position on certain issues, then the question becomes that why would the other side read you or come to you? And I think that question uh, ultimately uh, becomes important because you need to have a conversation with the other side. If you want to sort of uh, reach out, if the left wants to reach out to the right, right wants to reach out to the left, uh, that conversation, it seems to me, is not happening in the social media because, uh, and we will talk about social media later on, uh, we are increasingly becoming segmented in, in our own spaces. Uh, it, it's not happening in terms of, uh, I don't see that happening in terms of newspapers because newspapers increasingly are being identified with certain uh, political spaces. So the question for think tanks is, can we overcome that barrier? Is it in us to overcome that barrier? What, what sort of potential there exists and what, therefore what kind of strategies do we adopt? Because if we start saying that, look, we need to adopt a strategy which sort of takes us back to our base, that I believe in these principles and therefore I need to rally my base, you know, which is a standard political uh, op operative strategy, then that for a democracy becomes very dangerous because then the whole other space is not being, uh, you will not be able to tackle that. Now, the, I think the questions that we are raising fundamentally about the future of democracy, uh, the future of public participation, I think the earlier uh, panel in which we discussed how do you reach out to other stakeholders. 
how do you reach out to them? And I think that's a question for both these uh, panelists because they operate from different vantage points. I think Hindu operates from a vantage point where the art <coughs> ideology is very clear. So I'm not so sure that many people who don't believe in Hindu's ideology contribute to your website or contribute to your uh, organization. But I think uh, for Brookings, perhaps, uh, if I may, uh, you know, as you were saying, we, we, you know, you, you, people for all kinds of, from all kinds of vantage points can come and write for your website or, or do research for you, uh, I'm not so sure. But at ORF, uh, certainly, you know, we have people who write from, from the extreme left to the extreme right to the entire middle. We have people who contribute to that space. Uh, so, so the question, therefore, becomes how do you bridge that gap and how do, you know, these two uh, organizations who come from two different vantage points on this question, how do they deal with this particular aspect, which seems to me to be fundamental if we are to reshape the ar architecture of think tanks in India and, uh, and sort of uh, elsewhere. The other small point I want to make is, uh, is about uh, the, you know, where do we get people from? And that's a big question. I think all of us who, um, uh, who are dealing with think tanks today have faced this question. Where is the talent? Especially young researchers. Now, uh, it's, uh, I think some good has happened out of the things that some young students come are from who are getting who are studying abroad doing a master's come back to India and want to do um, you know even limited uh, engagement with Indian public sector uh, Indian uh, think tank world so I think we are seeing some youngsters joining that space but largely how do you motivate a young uh, student from India's universities not simply in Delhi but even provincial universities that this is a career to think about or are we, what kind of research are we doing in our universities that make them suitable for the kind of work we are doing? Because again, industry complains that, look, your graduates are on, uh, cannot be recruited. Similarly, we can also complain, you know, why, why you know, the students, you know, we, they can't even write one page memo, so how do, we, how do we get them? So I think the question is, are we interacting enough with these stakeholders, especially the universities who are teaching our young graduates, as to when they come to the market and when they join us, uh, we, have a, we have a base from which we can pick these students up and, and train them and, and sort of guide them uh, as, as public policy scholars. And I think these, this to me is, 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 is extremely uh, in fundamental in terms of our strategy of developing young scholars. Yeah, I'm, I'm really just asking a follow-on question. I'm Neelam Dev from Gateway House, and it's mostly what uh, the space that Harsh has covered already. One of the issues we have, maybe because we're based in Mumbai and there is, of course, a difference in terms of access, uh, a lot of the young uh, uh, researchers that we get are all trained in uh, American or British universities. And, you know, when I worked in the U.S. Congress, one of the things they always said is that where you stand depends on where you sit. And where you stand on issues depends on where you're coming from. And I don't know whether anybody else finds that an issue not necessarily a problem, but is that an issue for you? <coughs> uh, hello, uh, I'm Jyoti Parikh, uh, Director of Integrated Research and Action for Development. Um, you know, uh, I'd like to think more about uh, th uh, cooperation among think tanks for, uh, and if we have a list of some of your uh, think tanks, uh, you know, we can do jointly, sometimes fundraising, fund, sometimes uh, data gathering, sometimes uh, and a lot of value addition can be done or synergy can be generated. If we know, suppose I want to connect with Africa uh, think tanks, I'd recently gone to uh, Poland and uh, COP for COP24, I was looking for think tanks in Poland. You had some on your list, but it was not easily accessible. Uh, we would also like to see, uh, can join hands in either advocacy or uh, sometimes uh, uh, doing um, uh, opinion on certain matters. So, uh, you know, joint request for something. So it's uh, uh, very important uh, for also TTCSP to have more visibility by uh, doing, uh, encouraging this think tank cooperation and some of us can uh, organize events uh, uh, under the banner of TTCSP, not just as your annual uh, event, but uh, on, on a thematic area. Um, I was also uh, thinking that in, uh, at least in India, uh, think tanks have made a big difference in the area of climate change. In fact, uh, so many think tanks uh, 
have really contributed a lot in uh, government uh, policies and government uh, thinking. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, the, the examples are Terry, I mean, my own institution, Irade, CEW, uh, CPR, uh, these are um, NC STEP and many others like that. And uh, together, uh, CAC is another one. Uh, together we um, have uh, advocated and, and somehow sometimes uh, reduce their apprehension of uh, doing more for mitigation or sometimes connecting them to co-benefits and so on. So various viewpoints have been presented and many of them are acted upon and now government regularly seeks us every time there is a co-op. Uh, it's always the think tanks which are doing the work. It's not the universities, not the national labs. Uh, so we are uh, usually doing this work. So I would say also climate change is one area where uh, we can get together. Thank you. My question is basically on looking at how do we actually get research done on the field at a very ground level and articulate it and put it forward to the governments to act. Uh, we had this whole conversation for morning about the global and the local and the global. But as think tanks like us, which work in areas outside Delhi like Goa, we do a lot of field research and we try to influence uh, certain um, arms of the government to act in a particular way. So in a way, uh, think tanks do act as pressure points. So is there any ways you can act uh, as pressure points beyond what we are doing to have a long-term conversation on issues on critical importance like health, education, poverty? And the second is also about maintaining neutrality in these times of increasing polarization. I think uh, think tanks tend to take certain position, especially as Harsh mentioned on the social media, we tend to get take certain positions and then retract and you know you don't have you don't maintain that space of neutrality and thereby it does impinge on the public trust and confidence on think tanks as well so how do we deal with this kind of issues thank you uh, my issue with uh, the whole issue about think tank is that what is the model of the think tank we're thinking sitting in uh, India? There are two types, like one is government-aided think tanks and one is private think tanks. Government think tanks have their own issues, and their issues are very different from the uh, private think tanks. In the government think tanks, there is no issue of funds, because they have regular grant, they have a permanent job, they have a hierarchical cadre, and they enter as an assistant professor, they retire as professors, and they have a long life. But the interesting point which I'm trying to say for the government think tank is, we advertise for director post three times. And the applications which we came, like I'm based in Patna, Ancient Institute of Social Studies in Patna. So three times screening committee met, the search committee met, and they found none of the applications suitable because good people are not willing to travel to Bihar, Patna. Second is, we advertise for all the professors posts in all the disciplines in our institute. There was no application. Not a single application came for any post. If you advertise a post in Delhi, or Bangalore, or for that matter, Hyderabad, or any cosmopolitan center, there will be a pile of applications. So you must think in terms of that region-wise also, think tanks are suffering. They have their own deprivation syndrome of being in a region. Like she said in Goa, we are doing a lot of good work and we are piled up with work. We are not complaining on that. But getting the right person for the right place is a big tough issue, real tough issue, quality recruitment. Now, coming to the whole issue of think tanks, how the youth sees it. And we have interacted with uh, youths in several forums, and they don't know anything about think tank. They want a safe, secure government job. They want permanent job. They want government job. That is the issue which the youth is facing. The third is about the neutrality factor. Sponsored projects have a hidden hand behind it. And there is always a linkage of the particular state, government, policy, and then 
funding for that project. If you are deviating from that, that hidden hand is withdrawn. The whole funding comes crashing down. So neutral for what? For this side or that side? You cannot be neutral. And the last thing which I uh, wanted to say was that there is no convergence of think tank. James has been trying very hard. This is the third think tank Indian forum. And now if you do Google search, you'll find James and his ranking of uh, uh, think tanks being very prominently uh, displayed. Earlier it was not there. So visibility has come. This visibility and this movement for consolidation of the think tank forum has to be strengthened more at a bigger level. We are sitting here, but there are 52 or 100 think tanks uh, which are not here. And first thing around uh, when James had called us, or second, in the third, most of them are missing. So there should be some sort of a uh, convergence, integration, and there should be some unity among the think tank forum. Instead of competing interests, they should be consolidating. Thank you. No argument from me on that. <laughs> in terms of um, where we are, I think that in terms of the, the issues, for me, the power of this group is the group and, the, and, the, and, and this sort of um, coming together around what are the core issues that as a community we should focus on and doing something about it. Uh, because I think for me the, the frustrating frustration of some of these meetings is that we talk about the problems but we never get to doing something about them. And I think that we have, there are a number of things here that are <coughs> manageable um, and in terms of, both in terms of funding and communicating to government and to other donors what India think tanks need because I think people get the fact in terms of the importance of India and the value of it. I think that it's, it's an opportunity missed both in terms of communicating to um, the national government but to international donors what would make think tanks in India more innovative, stronger and sustainable is something that this group needs to articulate and articulate with a specific set of recommendations is that these are the things we need. That is this group, because it's not a single institution saying it, has power and potential influence. And in terms of recruitment and the challenges, they're fundamentally not terribly different than when we met in 2015. The question is how much have we done about that? And, that there, and it's not an impediment, it's an opportunity for this community to sort of say, here are five things that we need. Um, and, you know, and a joint voice, just a short white paper that lays those recommendations out and with some possible suggestions of how uh, th those issues might be addressed in terms of recruitment, in terms of resource mobilization, in terms of presence at regional and global meetings. Um, that is in the, inter the national interest of the country to be present. Those, to me, are, are, are pretty important and easily fixed. And then also in terms of the questions of, of making Indian think tanks fit for the future in terms of data, technology, et cetera, and fundraising, all of those things, to me, are, would be immensely beneficial. And it's my hope that that's what comes out of, the, out of this group. And so, thank you, everybody. I'd like to go from Jim, starting with Jim. Ideas Lab, yes, go for it. I think we should all pitch ourselves together. And uh, how do we go? How do we do it? Um, rather than perhaps Jim could think of a year-round informal email chain amongst us, amongst ourselves, not just on when we have particular summits coming up, uh, but also if, if um, we could initiate an email circle, we could uh, do something on that and perhaps when we, by the time we meet next time, we have quite a few uh, ideas that have been incubated well enough to let loose. Mm -hmm. 
and go forward. Uh, Pant, Ambassador Dev and our friend. Um, I think I'll, if, yes, where, where one stands, where one sits, depends on where one stand. And, uh, sorry, where one, doesn't matter, it's the same. Yeah, and uh, yes, neutrality, but Pontius Pilate said what's truth. We come back and say what's neutrality. I would rather emphasize more on credibility than neutrality. Uh, you are what you are, are you credible enough about it? Are you, are you saying what you are saying you're doing? Are you, is there transparency? Is there, I'm, I'm sure that if I were to read something which is a publication, even if I may like what it is, even if my ears may like what they say, my eyes may like what they, my mind would not if it's not credible. I would rather go to borrow a phrase, the other side, if it's credible, and read it. So I think we should, and when we come to neutrality, uh, uh, what is that to be neutral when there is something uh, which is against what has been set out in the pop in, in a in a in a charter called the Constitution? Is there another side to it, or are we looking at? Uh, are we tempting into going into a false balance? Like suppose one says a place of worship was demolished. Is there another side to it? That's, that's something we need to really ask ourselves. So the question we really are going to go is uh, credibility a shade more than neutrality. Because as we know, it's, um, uh, there's a lot that happens which gain their own dynamic. And uh, once credibility is lost, everything else is lost. So I think we as a body, Come whichever view we may, absolutely fine with that. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely fine with that. Each one is, is entitled to an ideology. Each one is entitled to uh, how the uh, state should function. Each one is entitled to that. But let's be credible about it. Let's be substantive about it. And let's not get into uh, name calling, which is, I'm going sliding into the media aspect of it, which is we fast becoming a world where uh, branding, branding as in not in marketing branding, but in medieval and ancient branding mm -hmm. is happening. Uh, the drop of a hat, names are being called, tarred, feathered, and driven away on um, four-legged creatures. We, we're living through that again. So I think, and it's, it's, it's nothing to panic over, it's nothing to take personal umbrage, um, but I think it's, it's something to take a step back and have a look at where things are and then take it forward from there. Um, and um, is, have we faced an issue because of why, where we are? No, not at all. Uh, not at all. The, again, name calling, everything happens, but then I would like to believe that when it comes to credibility, some newspapers have made it very clear that they're more credible than the others. And um, there we stand and there it goes. No, no, some newspapers, yeah, some, some organizations like that, some think tanks, some companies, so everywhere. So I think uh, if we were to take our ideas lab forward and then find that commonality, I think credibility would be one commonality because once we get into neutrality, it becomes uh, a lot of multiplication of voices and um, where does one, pitch one against another. If, if, if point X is internally consistent, uh, drawing from academic, uh, the academic hat, you have your internal consistency, you have your rigor, you have that, go for it. And uh, so with the other side as well. So let's, uh, let's forget about bipolarity for, for a moment because there's so much of space in between from which both sides can draw and benefit from. Um, completely agree with, I mean, neutrality is important, but if you're transparent on assumptions uh, and methodology, then people can take it at face value and actually learn from, I wouldn't even use the word side. 
I can approach the same problem from different domains, different disciplines, even within economics, there are different ways of tackling the same problem. I mean, I'll give a very, since you used the word AI, traditional things were, here's my equations, I want to do fitting and find out what's the value of the variables. With an AI approach, you would say, I don't know the form, I'm gonna let the data determine what the structural relationships are. You're approaching the same problem from two very different ways. So it, I, I think that's less of a worry, but we need to be open to all of these. And I think a lot of these questions fit into two, three buckets, so I'm gonna try and put them together. Um, you know, the, the point about Patna, finding someone, or, or go, you know, doing work in the field. One reaction to that is, how open are people to inputs? And, and the phrase that I really like was, it's very hard to wake up someone pretending to be asleep. And so if they have their mind made up, you're not gonna be of value. And so that's finding credible partners is a lot of the effort that we end up doing as think tanks because just writing good analysis that sits on a shelf doesn't quite effect change. So why would a professor go to a university in say Patna or somewhere else? Often they want good students. I mean, as a professor, that's really key to your productivity. And so that comes back to this critical mass issue that I, I'd flagged earlier, you had asked about. I'll come back to critical mass, but in, in, instead of a sports analogy, I'll use a recipe analogy, cooking. Yes, I'm fond of cooking. Um, you know, if, if I had someone cut and clean the vegetables prep, a sous chef, and if I had someone who would clean up after me, I could cook a lot more dishes. So if I have good researchers, slightly junior, data gatherers, data cleaners, data analysts, data scrapers, data uh, putting togetherers, then I could ask more interesting questions. But the reality is that's not just effort, it's an intellectual exercise as well. It's not just a laborious exercise. And so part of this critical mass is multiple layers of skill sets, multiple types of skill sets. So it's not just that I do I know how to bake, do I know Chetinard cooking, do I know Tuscan cooking, what am I trying to put together? So critical mass really needs different domains. So something like climate change requires people with global perspectives, economic perspectives, energy, technology, behavioral, innovation, it's all of the above. If you only have a siloed approach, no matter how cutting edge, world class in a silo approach, you're gonna come up with very different. So I think one of the needs is at the leadership level, think tanks want to groom people who are T uh, personalities. So there's a school of thought where you want breadth and depth. So a uh, T personality. Data, like how do you get sides to come together? So one was the openness, one was the transparency. But I'm a little wary of every time people says, oh, but the data or more analysis. Because <coughs> somebody once said data is like a toddler. Yeah, or data is like a toddler. You can make it say anything you want. Just got to know. Yeah. And so data is a means to an end. Regarding people, why is it that we do find, yes, a lot of our student, young hires are coming back from Europe or the US? And that's because they're probably better skilled, better trained. I'm gonna be very off the record blunt. Can, like you said, can people write a one page memo? Can they write a 10 page research report with, uh, with a narrative, with a flow, with consistency, with referencing, with logic? Those aren't skills that our universities are teaching. I'm, I'm sorry, can we get our universities to teach students to think? And that's been my biggest lament as an educator. They, they're very good at certain aspects, but they haven't been directed or given feedback that that's a valuable skill. Because the feedback mechanism, I've gone to universities, my colleagues have gone saying, here's a think tank, here's what we do. And at an MBA school especially, the, answer, the question sort of is, what's your pay package? I mean, I don't hold it against them. It's an investment they've made, it's a choice that they've made. Maybe that's not the right crowd only to look at. But even IIT graduates, technical, or e economics, you know, social scientists, part of it is stability. And so think tanks almost seem to have this problem of being in the middle. They don't have the stability of government nor the salaries of industry. And so now what do you do about it? So what do you offer them? And it's actually a slight dis Diversion, government salaries at the starting level are now far higher than industry. 
it's 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 actually shocking. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, at the starting level. Yeah, and then it switches over where industry has more appreciation. I mean, and, and so, yeah, long-term industry, that's what I said, starting level. And so in terms of hiring people, I think one of the things we try and do is really ask what's the longevity of a person, even when they say they're learning, they come back, because it takes one to two years to get them up to speed which means both institutionally, DNA-wise, capability-wise, domain skill-wise. I mean, if you actually have someone who knows all of the above, who knows the space, can write, has done the research, has already had a semi-track record, and they're coming for an entry-level job, well, I'm looking for such unicorns as well, you know. <laughs> or I can't afford them. So data science, you mentioned people hiring data scientists. These are folks who can go to industry consulting, Dalal Street, Wall Street, and make well more than I do. You know, young, fresh, sort of two years experience, which is fine. But then how do I get folks interested in this space? So when we go to universities, oh, you're consultants. Oh, you're academics. Understanding what public discourse and public good research is about, it's a very tough one. And luckily, it's a large pool globally and th there can be enough folks. So, I mean, it's, it's something that I think takes effort. Hopefully it's not a bottleneck. The opening concerns expressed about artificial intelligence, lawyers, doctors, and then what about think tanks? I think ultimately ideating is a human exercise. And uh, so the human element would very much want to be there. A, a machine may justify slavery. Or algorithms may justify anything. But I think it, it takes a human mind to intervene and say, for what? And so I don't think we need to be extremely concerned about that, but to use AI in a very productive manner. Um, what my colleague talked about is an issue about um, when you talked about critical mass, talked about the kind of data, uh, the skill sets available. Uh, we've been having that particular issue about somebody wanting somebody else to do data analysis, somebody else to do this. Uh, again, drawing from a background as a media organization, and as journalists who are trained to be one-man bands, so to say, uh, we when we choose a scholar, we see the application he or she is given, and is she able to deliver everything on her own. So that becomes a very important aspect. I think, I think uh, because if, we, if I am not adept at third level econometrics, I shouldn't take that. I can skin something, skin the same um, cat in another way. So I choose some other method. So I, I think we need to also rethink whom are we looking for. So we look for people, if I say that I can prove that three-legged rabbits exist in the world, are you able to prove it on your own? Do you have the skill sets to prove it? To prove it in the way you say you're going to prove it. So they don't come back and ask me for a uh, data scientist, don't ask me for a research analyst. Because all our lives we've been trained to do it as a one-man job. You know, like No journalist can go ask another journalist, help me with this. So I think it's, it's something we we could start thinking of ourselves as, uh, as, a, as a group to inculcate in people whom we recruit and thereby also reset our goals and ambitions in a calibrated manner. The other point which I wanted to say was about uh, uh, finding people in, in non-metropolitan uh, cities. I think that's a global phenomenon. It's, it's, it's everywhere. And uh, are there only pay packets that are going to determine it? I think in a country like India, language is another concern. Acceptability there is another concern. So unless somebody moves in quite early to a place which is outside one's own uh, stomping ground, it's going to be difficult. Why do doctors go a, lo a lot of, why do we have a lot of doctors in the UK? Because now not many of the British trained, British born doctors want to serve in rural areas there. 
So there are, there are parallels everywhere. So we don't have to overly concern ourselves about it, but need to find careful solutions. Are there solutions? I don't know. But I, hopefully an informal uh, sounding out about everybody with somebody taking um, the task of, it could even be a WhatsApp group or an email group. I think we'll be able to do much more. Thank you. A um, couple things. Uh, one is, I, th I mean, I, I think that the recruitment issue is something that is ideally suited for a collaborative effort in terms of the institution. I mean, I, I think of uh, the, there is in the United States, the Association of Professional Schools in International Affairs, which essentially do joint recruitment for their programs. And they do have uh, an in-person, but also uh, information sessions online, which I think in terms of the recruitment challenge um, is, uh, something that could easily be addressed. I have every semester 60 interns. I have in that group always um, at least six or eight from India or whose families are from <coughs> India. Uh, and so, and we, and I help place them. So any of you that are interested in hosting an intern, um, uh, I would be more than glad to you know, steer those uh, students your way. Now there are others who have an interest in India, but are not, but you know, Indian descent. Um, the other thing, which I think is larger for all of us, is uh, teaching at an Ivy League university um, and having 60 interns every semester. Uh, the uh, erosion of basic skills, and not to be an old fogey, um, you know the. Uh, students have no time for a literature review. Right, right. They, they, you know, they don't know how to do it, and I really know it, so why do I need to do that? And I can go online and get the answer. Uh, no patience for data collection. So those are the, f the two things that I force them to do at the outset and to understand that that's where the value added is. The other part is just you know, basic professional skills um, that are astounding to me how deficient uh, they are. But, you know, that's the advantage of a, of a, of a summer internships and mentoring um, in terms of understanding what is um, perfect. I, I fire on a regular basis vi volunteer interns, um, which is not something that they want to put on their resume. And most of them don't understand that employers now on a regular basis, they must divulge every job and internship that they've had and that they will come and ask me about that. And I tell them up front, you know, that this is something that's likely to happen and that I am very demanding. Um, and, it, you know, this is the expectation that you're going to be treated as a professional. And kids still don't get it. And then finally, I mean, the grand revelation for me was teaching at an Ivy League, preparing for a midterm, thinking that I was helping the students by saying these are the readings that you need to do. The new reality, which was you know seven years ago, shattered for me. A student had the audacity to stand up and say, Dr. McGann, can't you tell us what we need to know? Why do we have to read all this stuff? Uh, which I then said is not terribly different than a policymaker. Um, and, and so they're, they're, you know, they're prepared for that, but it's a new reality. And those are broader challenges that I think we, as in terms of what is the, you know, the feeder for that and, and major schools of public policy and international affairs have similar experience with not their undergrads. I would supervise master's thesis and they, I constantly say, have you consulted the literature on the topic? zero and then I take 30 seconds and do a search and say here are five studies that are looking at what you're doing have you you might want to think about at least perusing them before you submitted your proposal and so these I think are broader challenges that we face but I think they are also challenges that we can meet uh, together um, if there are not other additional questions or interventions uh, we're going to um, have the group photo now. 
which will be outside on the stairs. Uh, and then we'll uh, come back and convene for the, for the next session. Okay. okay, one intervention. Yes. Yeah, no problem. India on a short term or a long term basis and have we lobbied the government you know for a work visa or a consultancy visa you know I often um, on that issue uh, if you look at a small country that in terms of its think tanks and policy uh, punches way above its weight I, I look at Singapore in terms of the investment it made in recruiting um, talent for its think tanks and building them and making the strategic investment in schools of public policy, schools of international affairs as the feeders for think tanks and, and government. Um, and then also uh, in terms of looking where there is a need for specific staff and recruiting the best talent, not necessarily looking at is this problematic domestically because we have expats or foreign nationals who are uh, occupying those positions. It's important, and what Singapore and done is look at the long term is that indigenous capacity will be there in the future, but in the short term, in order to achieve the objectives we have, we're going to recruit wherever we need to get people in those positions, which I think is a, is a smart move. Yeah, no, I mean, that's the sort of thing I think that this, I mean, I think the reality is there should be, and I don't think it would tape terribly uh, long, at that a group from this immediately following this meeting should set out a specific set of things to work on which are achievable and begin to implement them. I think that's where we have to move. And with a common voice, with the endorsement of the in, uh, entire group, these are things that we need, and then as we do with everything else, disseminate that and influence policy and donors to help make it happen. Now, please. Uh, so just on that intern that global, we debated and realized that the effort isn't worth it below a certain months of duration. Yeah. And so interns were out the window because the effort needed for that was right. just disproportional. So it does need. So speaking of collective voice, yeah. I. Um, collaborate with a large group. I, 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 we're the secretariat for a large group of think tankers on the energy space, and it's below the radar so that it's open, frank discussions. But certainly, we've made collective uh, statements to the government, and that sort of collective has a lot of voice. So now there's 73 different uh, entities with the, there you this go. effort. So, there's power in numbers. Yeah, but at the same time, there's another flip challenge is why would people contribute to something else when they're busy enough in their day job? So getting that balance right is, is a continuous effort. Well, thank uh, both of you for uh, excellent um, observations about the unique dimensions of your institution.